You're watching the desert come alive in a very dramatic way, as it does every year about this time, with some absolutely breathtaking racing. It's the National Championship Air Races, presented by Reno Tahoe USA. Here we are and ready to go with the Steel National Championship Air Races, this institution from Reno Tahoe USA for 53 years now. The fans have been flocking here for this national championship. It is a big, big deal in the world of racing, in the world of motorsports. It is the fastest motorsport on earth. I'm Tommy Sanders, great to be with you. Joining us, the veteran air show pilot and announcer, the wild thing, Steve Stavrakakis. Tommy, thank you so much, it's great to be back. And for those of you that are new to air racing or new to our show, is what we've got here is we've got close course racing, the fastest of its kind in the world. Unlimited air racing, biplane racing, Formula One racing, jet racing, you name it, we've got it, along with it, one of the greatest air shows anywhere in the United States. The difference in our sport is we have to get all the contestants in the air before we can start the race. As our veterans fans know, our planes are led onto the course by a pace plane. He'll pull up away from the field, say, gentlemen, you have a race. Our pilots can then hammer the throttles, but they have to stay in their perspective lanes until they get to what we call the guide pylon down on the mountain. Once they get to the guide pylon, they can change and start jockeying positions, but all passes have to be made high and to the outside. You don't dare trade paint like you do in many other motorsports. Well, our first race is in the jet class, and sometimes how you start the race can really be the key. The start is probably the riskiest part of the entire event. You're lying uh, in a formation called line and breast, which means you stack an airplane here, you got an airplane here, and you just stack them like this all straight across. Um, the hard part is when you're flying, and you gotta, if you got to move your head all the way here, all the way here like this while you're flying and not moving the stick, it gets really, uh, and you're supposed to stay in our lane till the first turn. And while you're trying to move your head back and forth, people are bobbing up and down, people are accelerating, decelerating, a whole bunch of stuff is going on. And then at, at uh, pylon four, you gotta make a really critical turn. And you know we're all looking at the guy in front of us and the guy in front of him to try to figure out right to time that turn just right. So you know the whole critical, the most dangerous maneuver is that start. And a lot of people think it's, you know, when you're hitting the jet, it's not, it's that start. It, it gets really confusing, um, but it's what makes it exciting. Today, we have six bronze racers. Gentlemen, you have a race. You heard it, folks. Our pace plane has just released the bronze jet racers onto the course. In first place from Bathurst, Australia, Charlie Camarelli flying the L-29 Albatross jet, one of the little brother Elvo Chetneys to the L-39, like Zach McNeil is flying. And then behind him, we have Bob McCormick in another L-29 and Doug Matthews in a very unique airplane this year, the Marchetti S-211. While these aircraft are all different in their own characteristics, they do fit the qualifications, which means they're limited to production turbojet aircraft, have non-swept wings, and of course, no afterburners. We're going for six laps this time around. That's gonna be approximately 48 miles in total, and it will be going by very, very quickly. Our speeds are gonna bump up against and sometimes even over 400 miles an hour. Regardless of the speed, the competition is always fierce in this class. As you see right here, as Zach McNeil overtakes Charlie Camarelli in the L29. But Charlie says, hold on a minute, mate. I've got the inside preferred line. If you're gonna pass me, you're gonna have to go not only wide, but you're gonna have to go high. Both of which are gonna count against you because I've got the shorter course. But Zach McNeil's flying the more sophisticated of the Aero Bocchetti airplanes, the L39, the big brother to the L29. He's got the more sophisticated airplane, the more preferred trainer, but then again, Charlie says, mine's lighter, mate. Catch me if you can. Well, Charlie Camilleri and Zach McNeil, this duo has done a successful job of separating themselves pretty much from the other four planes competing in this competition, these six laps around this eight mile course here. It's just back and forth between the two of these guys. Of course, you've got parameters you have to fly 50 feet above the deck. That's as low as you can go and only 250 feet above that. So it's not a very high column. Sometimes it can get very crowded, but uh, up, at the, up at the front, up where the lead dogs are here, it's got pretty clean air. And speaking of clean air, it looks like Zach finally found something. He may have gotten around Charlie on the outside. It looks like a clean pass. 
If it is, he has taken the lead. He's finally got to that clean air, put that L39 out front of Charlie Camarelli. Zach McNeil from Corpus Christi, Texas, where he is a helicopter pilot. Flies two jet classes, as a matter of fact, here in Reno, but planes aren't, as we say, what he flies for a living. He is a pilot, though, and here's his pilot profile presented by Nevada. World within a state apart. Hey, my name is uh, Zach McNeil. I'm currently an active duty Navy pilot working for Chief of Naval Air Training out of uh, Corpus Christi, Texas as the helicopter uh, expert for the Admiral. Interestingly enough, it's the same Admiral in charge of the Blue Angels. So they work for us, it's pretty cool. This year we brought two jets. We got the L-39s and then we have behind me is uh, the Vampire. I, I was a rookie last year, I uh, wanted to go faster, so I had to get a faster airplane and uh, ended up getting two of them. So we're racing the uh, L-39 in bronze class and we're racing the Vampire in gold. Well, for the L-39, the bronze class, we had to, uh, we took the uh, tanks off the tips, we put some uh, fancy wing tips on it. Um, we didn't really lighten it a lot, uh, but we've, uh, we've done a lot of minor detail work. White flag, white flag. Zachary McNeil is heading into the final lap now with a comfortable lead. Yeah, and he's done a great job. Again, this is only his second year here at Reno, and uh, to bring two airplanes and fly this competitively is a, a true testament for his competitive nature as well as his piloting skills. Well, he was battling pretty hard against Charlie Camilleri. Now the real battle for third and fourth place, Robert McCormick, the Starship, race 27 and race 33, Doug Matthews, the Stallion. That one's going on right now, hot and heavy. But here we go, our leader bringing it on home. First win in the Jet Bronze class. Looking very, very good right now for Zach McNeil. He's going to be leading the way as he passes our pylon and takes the victory. Checkered flag, checkered flag. Great race by our Bronze Jet class. Uh, all of our racers finished in less than nine miles separation from each other. Uh, Zach McNeil, first place, Charlie Camilleri, second, Bob McCormick, third, and Doug Matthews in the Stallion, fourth. Plenty of excitement today already and plenty of excitement on the way as we take a look at an airframe from the mid-20th century that's race ready for today when we come back. The Steel National Championship Air Races is presented by Reno Tahoe USA. All seasons, 1,000 reasons. Travel Nevada, Nevada, a world within, a state apart. And by Steel, the number one selling brand of gasoline powered handheld outdoor power equipment in America. The Steel National Championship Air Race is truly one of the big events of the year in fabulous Reno, Nevada. Of course, watch the races by day and by night. Plenty of other attractions to take up your time. The nightlife is fabulous. Here in Reno, the casino action, the dining, the dancing. Of course, by day, there's plenty of music for you as well. Barbecues, festivals of all kinds. It is a wonderful destination as we get ready to take you out on the course. And this is the T6 heat number two. T6 pace and flight race control, third on to the course. Third on to the course, six pace. He's doing all a nice job. Gentlemen, you are released. Well, this is going to be good, and Steve, there's so much history in these airplanes here. The T, I'm assuming, means trainer, and these were they not the trainers that sort of bridged the gap between the basic trainer and the trainer that got you ready to fly those sophisticated warplanes, right? That's right. These are advanced trainers built by North American Aviation. Uh, most of them came out of Texas. That's why they're known as the Texans. The Marine and Navy versions were called SNJs. They've got the, the big Pratt Whitney 1340 cubic inch radial engine. They all make 650 horsepower. So it's a very, very competitive race for the fact these are all production aircraft and they all meet the same specs. Well, it's Nick Macy from Thule Lake, California, who took uh, race 1A, the first of these three races that lead to the national championship. And it's the same song, second verse here as we get into race 2A with Nick Macy taking the lead here. Not a huge lead, though. He's got Dennis Buhn and Chris Rushing close on his tail. Yeah, Dennis Buhn is our defending champion. He's got six titles to his name in the T6 class. But then again, this week, uh, Nick Macy, another six-time champion, has been giving him fits as he is right now. And taking up the third spot for another time is Chris Rushing in Baron's Revenge. Some good racing going on here, bumped up over 230 miles an hour in race 1A, and they're very close to that pace right now. 
Pretty soon we're going to get ready to, to, to have something special for you, sort of an audio treat. So much of the crowd here, these 150,000 strong crowds, show up not only to watch the races, but once in a while, close your eyes and just listen. racing fan that is the sound you love to hear nick macy tule lake california race number six still holding on to that lead right now what a great battle though for second and third place between chris rushing and dennis buen the distinct sound of the t6 texan that low rumble you hear that's that big beautiful pratt whitney radial engine that crackling sound you hear are the propeller tips as they go supersonic and create miniature sonic booms You know, Tommy, the T-6s have been credited with training more pilots than any other aircraft in the history of aviation. Well, they are truly amazing planes. They've been in the air for some 80 years. But I'll tell you what, they were never, ever designed to go this fast. When these planes were originally designed in the late 30s, they were basically flying 165, 170 miles an hour is their fundamental purpose was put people up, go through training maneuver exercises, probably no further than a couple hundred miles of base on their longest trips. All of these planes basically conform to the stock configurations they had in the day of their design. So how is it that some of these, just like yesterday, we had a new course record set. Nick Macy in Six Cat, he set a new course record at 251 point something miles an hour. And it's a consequence of a lot of small, important improvements that have been made. A series of things that make them aerodynamically smoother, i.e. create less drag, basically shed the weight. And it's the combination of these that have made them faster today than they were ever imagined to be when they were designed. White flag, white flag. Some incredible history that's an important part of today. Entering the final lap now, course record or not, Nick Macy now has Chris Rushing matching him move for move. A lot of strategy goes into the T6 class. That's why they're always so evenly matched in such tight, close races. Definitely a spec class or a spec category. I mean, the horsepowers match up, just about all the elements. The physical elements match up, and so much is on the skill, the tactical ability of that pilot in order to make the difference between him and the rest of the field. You know, every once in a while, Every, every so often, you'd have a T6 that ran away with it. Uh -oh. They always found something illegal when they looked. Well, this is good. This one speaks for itself. Nick Macy in front and just a few feet behind. That's Chris Rushing from Northridge, California. It's going to be a battle down till the final second. Can Nick Macy hold him off there? He's just got to get it past the pylon, getting closer and closer, but it looks like Nick Macy is going to control this thing to the very end. Although, yeah, yeah, he's going to do it. Nick Macy, your winner, two heats in a row in the T6 category. But you know, the great thing about the T6s are the races within the races. Watch this one, Tommy. John Lomar, race 88, going after Greg McNeely. Will he catch him? Oh, he almost got the job done there, but he's going to wind up in fifth place. The crowds are never disappointed when the T6s take the course. So another win. In fact, that's two in a row for Nick Macy. Chris Rushing in second place, and Dennis Bue in the midnight missed three in third place here. Plenty more to come from Reno. The swift and nimble biplanes are coming up in their pursuit of the gold of the national championship. And like they say, sometimes the best laid plans, well, you know how that one ends. You're watching the Steel National Championship Air Races, presented by Reno Tahoe USA. A town that really does believe in this event, seeing as this is the 53rd year for the air races here. It's a beautiful thing here, a beautiful town where art is appreciated. That is for sure. A lot of artists in action everywhere you go. One of the greatest attractions here, the National Automobile Museum. If you're into this sort of thing, this is one of the finest automotive museums in the world, bar none. Reno, a great place and a great crowd yet again today, Saturday, the big qualifying day, pole position for the finals. In many cases, people enjoying biplanes today, among other things. Yeah, for veteran biplane racer Marilyn Dash, 
who experienced the thrill of victory earlier in the week with a win in her heat race, experienced the agony defeat when the tail wheel of her Ruby biplane got hung up in an expansion joint in the Reno runway. You see the result. Both will be back in 2017. Well, now it's time for some serious biplane racing right here, the biplane class. This is their third race of the week on the way to qualifying for the finals for the gold race. This is the 3.5-mile course, the short course. It's six laps around there. We're getting close to uh, 220 miles an hour in some of these cases here. And again, Steve, this is a standing start, and we are getting underway. Yeah, these are sport biplanes. These are all very, very similar in size, configuration, and performance. Now this is a class that's made up of aircraft. They're limited to 360 cubic inch engines. They have to have fixed gear, fixed pitch props. They're not allowed to run turbochargers and only pump gas, no funny fuel. Eight biplanes in this Heat 3A here in the hole, but one of them is the Pitts Air Series, that type of plane. The one exception is the Mong Sport run, the Reno Rabbit run by Jeff Rose, who, as a matter of fact, won the first race in this series and is the leader as we stand right now. When setting these airplanes up, the pilots and crew chiefs have to use a lot of strategy. Again, they're limited to a fixed pitch prop, much like having one gear on your bicycle or the propeller on your, your boat. You have to pick a pitch that's going to be the most versatile for your condition. If you have a flat pitch, you're going to get off the line very, very quickly. But then again, you're going to, be, you're going to have a slow airplane on top end. If you choose too high of a pitch, you're gonna have great top end, but you're gonna get blown away at the start. They've gotta find something that works on a good start, yet keeps them in contention once they're up and running on the course. Mainstay out here is the Pitts Special, the little Pitts aerobatic biplane. The other ones are the Mong Sports. For years, uh, this class was dominated by a man by the name of Tom Aberly. He had a highly modified biplane called Phantom that carried him to nine victories in this class. They're out in front in the Mong Sport is Jeff Rose. This airplane is a Mong Sport, and this, this Mong is a much smaller plane, has a smaller fuselage, and the diameters are smaller. Going through the air, that's just, you know, has one advantage. So this plane's kind of rare. There's been other Mongs in the past that have raced. You know, Tom Aberly has, has the Phantom, which was, is based off of a Mong fuselage. The Mong frame is a nice place to start, and then you modify it from there. So it's, it's quite a surprise and an honor to be in, in the position I'm in this year. Biplane's obviously a very familiar profile, but also obvious the fact that they've done a lot of tweaking to gain airspeed shorter wings for a start, Steve. Now, Kirk Murphy must have been listening to us a little while ago, Tom, because watch how he's using every inch of sky out there. He's going high, he's going low, he's trying to trade altitude for airspeed. He's not content to follow Eric Zine around this time, and it looks like it might pay off for him. He's done the altitude part of it. Let's see if he can right pick up right, the speed, right, get some right. traction. Eric Zine. And there's the pass right there. You think a change and even a fraction of a mile an hour can make a difference? We just saw that play out right there as Kurt Murphy overtakes Eric Zine. Well, biplanes are notoriously high drag. They've got two wings. They've got the struts between them. They've got the flying wires between them. So biplanes are notoriously high drag, and these guys will find any way they can to reduce it any place they can. In the last lap, of course, Jeff Rose and the Reno Rabbit out front, but this battle between Eric Zine and Kirk Murphy has been entertaining as it has been all week long here in Reno. You know, while Jeff Rose has enjoyed being out front most of the week, there's no less pressure when you're out front because you may not have another airplane nipping at your heel, but you're still a race within a race. You've got to make sure that you don't cut a pylon. You're watching gauges, you're watching instruments, you're watching sagebrush go by, you're watching the course, you're watching pylons again. Uh, you've got to make sure that you don't beat yourself. Yeah, you're, you're running a race against gravity all the time. You're in the air as well. That's an opponent that never goes away, but uh, he's vanquished all of them. Jeff Rose, the Reno Rabbit, third straight win here at Reno in the biplane. There's a great bird's eye view looking back at the Steel Star finish pylon, where we got to see Kirk Murphy go by his second place and third place in Eric by Eric Zine. Eric Zine, uh, second place, one time, third, two times in the three races overall in this division, but three wins. That's the story for our leader there, Jeff Rose, the Reno Rabbit race number 23, as he moves into the top position to start the gold round, the national championship round. What's on the way next? Well, that doesn't look good. Find out what's going on when we come back. The Steel National Championship Air Races is presented by 
Reno Tahoe USA, all seasons, 1,000 reasons. Travel Nevada, Nevada, a world within, a state apart. And brought to you by Steel, built in America, believing in America. Huge crowds again here in Reno at the Steel National Championship air races before the break, Steve. We saw the crowds checking out something we really didn't like the look of. What's going on here? Shawami Reed, one of our sport pilots, was taking off. She noticed uh, some heat in the cockpit. She did a, an immediate 180, put the airplane back on the ground. Uh, the exceptional crash fire rescue crews from uh, Reno were all over it, and they put the fire out on this aircraft. Oh, that's a good final result, no doubt about this. This is the third and final heat race coming up now for the sport class. Best finishes determine your pole position in the goal race, the national championship. Andrew Finlay is a guy who can explain the lure of this type of racing. So kind of the, what the air races are, it's the kind of NASCAR in the sky. So we're, we're racing wingtip to wingtip, doing close to over 400 miles an hour. In some cases, we're, our team's just bump, getting ready to bump that 400 mile an hour mark. So uh, it's, it's really wingtip to wingtip racing. It's, it's 50 feet off the floor in the desert, going as fast as we can. Uh, we're racing experimental airplanes, and a lot of these airplanes are built at home. Um, so the, the home boat class, you'll see a lot of uh, carbon fiber airplanes, but all the way down to the RV airplanes. And so the, the RVs are the Vans RV, they're a, uh, if you look at uh, some of the uh, riveted together planes and sheet metal aluminum, that's what those are. Hold it, Eric, you got plenty of room to move out there. Everybody hold what you got, looking good. Hold it. Gentlemen, you have a race. As our jet pace plane once again releases the Sport Gold Racers onto the course, they have to maintain their lane all the way until the guide pylon. They can accelerate ahead of the guy next to him, but they can't cross over in front of him. On the pole, one more time, is Jeff Lavelle in that glass air. It's a twin turbo, 580 cubic inch, Lycoming engine. You wonder why Jeff's pushing it so hard, because if you don't make the Sunday race, you don't make any money. But then again, you want to place as high as you can on Saturday because that gets you that ever important pole position in Sunday's gold race. So as he dives in once more, look at race number 39, Jeff Lavelle in that glass air, twin turbocharged, 580 cubic inch, qualified at over 403 miles per hour. Right on his tail, the reigning champion, John Parker in a Thunder Mustang II, the Falconer V12 engine. John says, it's not over till it's over, I'm right on your tail. Jeff Lavelle certainly been the star of this category through the two previous races here. And like you say, going for that number one pole position as we head into the final race. John Parker, the champion, defending champion from 2015. Trying to get in the win column one more time before they head to the goal race as well. But boy, once again, Jeff Lavelle looks very, very formidable at this point in the race. Now we talked about the engines, Tommy. Let's listen to him. Tommy, you can't wind a Lycoming engine much tighter than Jeff Lavelle does on race number 39. Yeah, you sense there's not much let up in Jeff Lavelle there. And of course, he, he faces the, the, the same road you have to ride with every motorsport. You want to push your stuff to the very limit. You want to get as far ahead of the pack as you can. But on the other hand, you don't want to push it to the point where it breaks. When it breaks, your day is done. We've seen that happen in this race. Some people who wound up on the wrong side of that line include race 67, Swiss Thunder right there did not start. Also not starting 47, Lucky Mojo and 44 we saw there, Miss Karen. Meanwhile, back in the race, it's John Parker doing the best he can just to keep up with Jeff Lavelle. White flag, white flag. White flag is one lap left to go and Jeff Lavelle in firm control of this race. You know, Tommy, I love to watch the expression on the people's faces that haven't been to Reno for a few years, and they hear these sport golds come around. They just look in disbelief when they hear the way these engines are being pushed and the performance they're getting out of them. Absolutely. The performance, the speed is just incredible. You, you mentioned, I mean, the, the best thing you say about it, they have to have a jet starter plane. I mean, that says all you need to know about how far these little class of, of airplanes have come. Now keep in mind the physical conditioning of our pilots too. You see when that airplane's up in a bank like that, they're pulling anywhere from two to five Gs in those corners. They want to pull as little as possible so they don't bleed off energy, but they're still being physically put to the test every time they leave the ground on this race course. 
this last lap turned it into a victory lap more or less for Jeff Lavelle. Just a great race, a flawless race run this time around as he has in the two races previous. But if you look at our graphic, you can see how close they are. One pylon cut will be all the difference in the world in how they place. Checkered flag, checkered flag. There we go, the checkered flag for Jeff Lavelle. Race 39 takes three races in a row and one left between that plane and a national championship. Our congratulations to Jeff Lavelle. So much more racing on the way, including Formula One. We come back. Reno, Tahoe, USA, the biggest little city in the world. Because it's got all the big city attractions and the small town feel. It's got the great nightlife, the shopping, the arts, and afterwards you can get outside. Plenty of fishing opportunities around here, including where the Truckee River flows out of Lake Tahoe and into Pyramid Lake. Pyramid Lake, well known for those trophy sized cutthroat trout, some of the biggest inland trout in the world. And here we go, Tommy. This is the Saturday edition of the Formula One Bronze, and this always proves to be a close, close, close race. Seven teams in this one are going to do eight laps around our short course, our 3.5 mile course here. That's going to be right at about 25 miles. We've got speeds that'll be well, bumping up near 200 miles an hour. This is the Bronze class right now, and there's going to be some tie racing, like you said. Now, as we talked about before, the strategy of the crew chiefs is to decide which prop they're going to put on these airplanes. Are they going to pitch it for a quick start, or are they going to pitch it with more of a cruise style, style prop uh, for the top end? Because that's always a lot of strategy that plays out. If you go with a flat pitch prop, it's like taking off in low gear in your car. Unfortunately, you don't have the option of changing gears. No. So, if, so if you get a good start, you're going to get ahead, but you're also going to run into that speed wall. If you start out with a cruise prop, you're going to be a little slower on takeoff, kind of like starting a little with a higher gear on your bicycle. It takes a little longer to get going, but once you do, you're going to be faster on the top end. Let's take a look at the bottom end of this racing field, at least at the start, what was the bottom end? Philip Goforth there, that red plane with the white wings, the El Bandito, passing race eight and race 46. He is on his way back to our leader now. That's David Roloff's in the sonic boom right now. Right on his tail, though, second place, that's Scott Holmes. The stronger beer, red and white plane as well. Now, one of the things that we've seen all week long that makes the formula such a crowd favorite are we have races within the races, as we see here. Again, we've got a lot of passing going on in the back. We've got a lot of competition right up on first and second. Again, this is Formula One racing. This is a smaller plane, very much a spec format here. These uh, engine specs, the size-wise, they're very much the same. The wing area, all those, uh, all those items, a level playing field for all these guys. So. Uh, the, the wily pilot is what can make the difference so many times, and a crew that's really skilled at preparing for race day. That's right, they're all limited to O200 Continental engines, and the airplane must weigh at least 500 pounds. So again, they are very, very spec-oriented. Uh, one of the first pure racing classes ever. They've been in existence since 1947. Scott Holmes now with the lead. That's race number nine. He's also the top qualifier for this race, so he's probably thinking I'm right where I ought to be. Can he hang on, though? Just the pack trying to run him down here. A lot of volatility up and down. Now look at the right here. That's the number 10 got plane. Another pass going on. Moving into second place. Now this is Goforth. He's been coming from the last place position. Now again, he's obviously chosen the right prop. He's gone with the cruise prop for top end, but he's also one of the newer style composite airframes going up against these older style Cassett airframes. Very, very apparent in the, the, the look at the profile of the wings as well as the fuselage on these two airplanes. So the risk is going with this cruise prop, he sacrificed the takeoff. Will he have enough laps to make up what the advantage is he's shown here? White flag, white flag. All right, Scott Holmes has got one job to do right now, and that's hold off this race 10 plane, Philip Goforth and El Bandito. That's going to be a full time job, though, from the look of what's happened so far. Well, he's staying consistent. He's flying a good line, but keep in mind too, he's having to pass every one of these airplanes. And as we've talked about in our other races, you can't dive to the inside as you can in a lot of motorsports. All your passes have to be high and to the outside. You have to stay out of the other pilot's blind spot. So he's actually flying a longer course than everybody he's chasing down. 
Scott Holmes from Edmonton, Alberta, one of the Canadian entries in this one right here. Stronger Beer, the name of the plane. I love the cockpit shot of Scott Holmes here. Look how tranquil he looks. He's in his own little world. You think he has any idea what's coming up on him from behind? Well, he can't see behind him, can he? You want to tap him on the shoulder. Say, so take a look to your right, bud. This is very, this is good stuff right here. I mean, he is, he is in the zone. He is cruising. He has taken this thing home, but uh, gosh, you just can't know whether he's aware of how close his nearest pursuer right there, Philip Goforth, is close enough to pass. Chase continues. Again, will he have enough laps to make this happen from last to first? That will be a phenomenal race for this pilot. We're running out of laps as we speak right now, so he's got to make something happen pretty quick. Get Scott, Scott Holmes in the zone, flying his race, nice tight course. He has the ad, has advantage of being on the inside running the shorter course, whereas Goforth is having to run a longer course every time he catches up to him. Sacrificing some speed to get some altitude as well, but he expects to get paid back on that when he makes his final move trying to pass Scott Holmes. Here's a great shot of the two different plan forms of these airplanes. The Cassett Racer in the front with the more Hershey bar wing and the new style composite aircraft in the back and Philip Goforth. They're small gains, but they are continual. He is wearing the sky down. Philip Goforth is determined to make that final pass and win this race. Now keep in mind too, as they overtake the slower planes, they both have to move out wider and higher. White flag, white flag. White flag now. One lap, one lap left to go for Philip Goforth to overtake Scott Holmes. One lap left for Scott Holmes to hang on. Now he, he just realized he's <laughs> now on a defensive course instead of an offensive course. This will be the longest lap of Scott Holmes' life. Yeah, he's got a big smile on his face and probably is savoring the moment. This is one of those things you live for as a pilot, is it not, as a competitive racer? Well, now he's trying to defend the victory versus going for the victory. So there's this, all the strategy changes now, but you can tell he's having a great time with it. These are obviously good friends and they have a very competitive nature between the two of them and it's showing in the cockpit footage. Scott Holmes shaking his head, no, you're not gonna do this, please. Please don't do this, this is my moment. But it may not be his moment when it's all said and done. Look how close they are right now. What a great shot of an old airframe versus a new airframe. And can they do it? They're gonna be rounding. This is gonna be the last dash to the steel star finish pylon. Can he do it? Nose is down, speeds up. It oh, looks yeah. like Philip Goforth is gonna do it from last to first to take the victory. One of the great performances of this great week here in Reno performance that I think all of us would deem worthy of being called the steel power move of the week. The bronze bearing in Formula One. What a race right there. And Philip go forth. Midland, Texas and the El Bandito going from seventh place and taking the win in the final moments of the final lap. And there's our replay. What a great shot. What a great race. Holmes, what, a, what an incredible moment he will never forget. And Philip Goforth definitely not forgetting this win in the desert in Reno in Formula One. Hey, coming up, an incredible jet race. The jet class is on its way, and you won't want to miss it. The Steel National Championship air races from incredible. Reno Tahoe, USA, definitely one of the most beautiful places in the world. And not just beauty for watching, beauty for getting in and enjoying. Hey, full activity, you can play golf here. One of the few places in the world you can play golf in the morning, ski in the afternoon, do it the other way around. Because of this incredible statistic, within 90 minutes of the Reno airport, you can find the largest concentration of ski resorts in North America, as well as 40, 40 golf courses. Just an incredible place, the biggest little city in the world. Reno Tahoe, USA, getting ready for some great action. The final clash before the gold round for this jet class. Take off off course, wind 290 at 8, gust 15. Looks good. Good minute. And a 7,000 feet now, gold jets, 280 knots for the Embraer sponsored gold jet race. 300 knots, hold what you got, gold jets. Ladies and gentlemen, the Emperor sponsored gold jet race. Gentlemen, you have a race. 
you heard it. As our pace plane, our beautiful Embraer Phenom 300 pulls up and puts our jet racers on the course. Now, as we've talked about before, they're gonna to race to the guide pylon. They have to stay in their perspective lanes. They can accelerate ahead of the people next to them, but they can't make the turn until they get to the guide pylon as they have right now. In first place, our top qualifier at 513 miles an hour, Rick Vandom and Ed Knowles' American Spirit. The pack starts to separate. The red airplane coming in is his teammate. That's Mike Steiger flying Ed Knowles' second airplane, another Czechoslovakian built L-39 Albatross jet. Well, Rick Vandom, as much as about anyone here, qualifies as for the legendary category. More on that a little bit later, but it has been a perfect week for him. One race so far in this uh, Jet A category and one win. Now, we have three Albatross jets in the front. Now, the Jet class was actually inaugurated in 2002 as an invitation-only class featuring only L-39 Albatross jets. And when they started pushing speeds around 500 plus, that's when the FAA stepped in and said, you know, we want to make sure they don't unsafely overfly the course. So they put a 525 mile an hour max on the course, which means Rick Vandom has to stay ahead of the number two pilot, but not beat himself by busting 525 miles an hour. Mike Steiger, second place. One of the planes uh, chasing our leader, as has been the case through all the jet racing so far in this class. Wind 290 at seven, gust one five. There he is, uh, that's Rick Vandom, kind of a local legend. He's a two-time champion in the jet class. Very, very much instrumental in the Reno Air Show and, of course, the development of this class, the jet class, and also the sport class. The innovator, the incredible competitor, and without a doubt, one of the Reno Tahoe USA top guns. A lot to learn about the history of Rick Vandom. Well, actually, uh, I have quite a history here. The three of us here that are uh, Jeff Turney, uh, Lee Beal, who was killed here in 2014, and myself were instrumental in starting both the sport class and jet class. So we became kind of the, the fathers to the kids as they came in and tried to uh, give them our background and our experience and develop something that was both fun for them to do, entertaining, but at the same time increasing their aviation skills to make them better and safer pilots. So a lot of the younger kids as they come in here, they look up to us having been around here a long time, and not always favorably, but they still look up to us. As much as I say I want their success, I still want to win. White flag, white flag. Success uh, so far coming pretty easy for Rick Vandom, especially in this race, the first race, easy victory then, and it's working out just the same way in this race number two on the way to the national championship round. Just a perfect, perfect execution. So much experience and so much real talent. That's right, this has been, That's right. This has been a great week for Ed Knoll's entire team. Uh, Rick Vandom, this will be his third victory if he can hold the week together here. He has two victories in the same airplane. This airplane is actually a three-time winner. Uh, it won the inaugural jet race back in 2002 in the hands of uh, shuttle commander Kurt Brown when he took the same airplane to victory. So the airplane's no stranger to the winter podium, nor is uh, Rick Vanda, who looks to hold on if he can put it together one more day. Today's victory will give him the pole in tomorrow's race, which is a huge advantage for the entire team. The pylon, checkered flag to Rick Vandom, all that experience. Checkered flag, checkered flag. Kept that speed right there, just under 500 miles an hour on average so far all week long. That's experience. That's knowing how to fly your airplane. Mike Steiger and Ed, Ed Knoll's second airplane took second, and killer color, David Culler Jr. from Virginia Beach, Virginia in third place. All right, one more race left in this Jet A category, and that'll be for the national championship, the gold race, but we got one more big race about to happen when we come back. When we return, the bad boys of air racing are back on the course. The Steel National Championship Air Races is presented by Reno Tahoe USA, all seasons, 1,000 reasons. Travel Nevada, Nevada, a world within, a state apart. And by Steel and the 36 volt Steel Lightning Battery System. What can you do on a single charge? 
The Steel National Championship air races, big crowd as always here at Reno Tahoe USA and they're ready for something special. All of these classes are about the sound, the fury, the speed, but this class right here, the Unlimited, seems to stand head and shoulders above the rest. These are World War II warbirds. They are the workhorses of the military back in mid 20th century. A crowd favorite out here and they certainly have their place in history. The Mustang, the P-51, longest range fighter in the world. A fighter pilot's dream. The unlimited race class is comprised of World War II aircraft, Sea Furies, uh, North American P-51 Mustangs, uh, Czech, uh, Checkmate, uh, which is a highly modified Russian Yak. They're the bigger, higher horsepower, faster airplanes. There's only two rules in our class. It must be piston-powered, propeller-driven. And the minimum weight is a, it's got, the aircraft's got to weigh at least 5,000 pounds. Basically, it's comprised of all World War II era of warbirds. I mean, the noise, the power, the ground shaking as these airplanes come by, it just drives the crowd wild. They love to see these airplanes. All right, racers, the uh, pylon's in sight. We're roll wings a little, start downhill. You heard it. Our unlimited racers are on the course. They can accelerate ahead of the airplane next to them, but they can't change out of their lanes. Once they get to the guide pylon, however, all bets are off and the race takes place. As expected, it's this year's top qualifier, young air race phenom Stephen Hinton and Bob Button's race number five voodoo. Fast qualifier this week at 475 miles an hour. The six-time champion in a two-time champion airplane out to make a statement this week. But right on his tail, the world's fastest rookie, Jay Kensalvi, in the R2800 powered checkmate. Always the bridesmaid, but never the winner yet. Let's see if Jay Kensalvi can put that little airplane, the smallest airplane in the field, on the podium. Race 86 and Jake and Salvi, no, not so far have they been able to challenge Stephen Hinton at any point during any of the racing. That plane is so great, that pilot is so great, but Jake and Salvi's a pretty celebrated guy himself. That's right, he's a decorated F-14 combat pilot. His mission today, catch Stephen Hinton easier said than done for Stephen Hinton. This week has gone pretty darn well, and though he hasn't had some serious competition, he is not at all lacking in motivation. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of competition right now, but the competition really is keeping the equipment running. So while we're not running a lot of power at the moment, uh, it's still enough to hurt the equipment. Uh, uh, I don't know what Checkmate is uh, doing. You know, it's, it's a fast airplane, but it's, uh, you know, second place sets the pace. So he can push us, but the airplane's not capable of the top speed that we're capable of. So it's a fast airplane, and, and Jay can solve the guy that's flying it and uh, does a phenomenal job flying it. You know, an ex-Navy guy, combat guy, he's not afraid to get his teeth in there. and. Uh, Flies a great line and it's a fast airplane. So, uh, so you know, so far we, we, our program's looking good. We just keep our head down and focus on ourselves. Back on the track. White flag, white flag. We're just about to finish lap number five for Voodoo. There they go right now, passing the pylon, heading into the final lap. Voodoo with an almost insurmountable lead right there, despite the best efforts of this very talented field. Taking a look now from the viewpoint of Brian Sanders, third place right now in the Dreadnought. That's right, Sanders' family has done an impeccable job of fielding not one, not two, but three unlimited aircraft in the gold race for the last several years. Back on the course with our leader, Stephen Hinton. Fast qualifier this week, 475 miles an hour, the obvious favorite to win gold on Sunday. Checkered flag, checkered flag. To no one's surprise, just a masterful effort for Stephen Hinton, he gets the top spot. But back in the field, we've got a couple more of the Sanders' beautiful Sea Furies. That's big brother Dennis Sanders taking on Joel Swagger, an Argonaut and 924. Beautiful lines of the Hawker Sea Furies at Reno. Yeah, if you're looking for the tight pacing in this race here, it happens in place five and six. Leaderboard shows the story, complete domination by Stephen Hinton in Voodoo. James Gonsalvi, a solid second place, and you know he's thinking, I don't have a whole lot to apologize for today. I think it went great. You know, there's a few things I want to work on, there's a few things I want to tighten up, but the goal for today was to 
to be solidly in second place, fly a nice clean course, and um, stay out of food his wake, which, which I was able to do. So um, I'm real happy with today. Yeah, so, you know, so far so good this week. Uh, I'm always apprehensively cautious. Um, you know, it's 75-year-old equipment that we're running. Although it's overall, uh, you know, parts can always break. So while it's another step, uh, check the box today. You know, tomorrow's the big one. So we'll just kind of bide our time again. Stephen Hinton, the Voodoo team, darn near perfect all week long. And you can bet they will be ready for their goal race for the national championship and the Unlimited and all the other classes. Coming up when we see you next time on the Steel National Championship Air Races.